The Meter Center hosts throughout the year a number of special lectures, and today it's our great pleasure to welcome Professor Noe of the Classics Department to give our fall Meter Center lecture. Professor Noe is Associate Professor of Classics here at Calvin College. He obtained his PhD at the University of Iowa. He is the translator of Franciscus Junius's work De Theologia Vera, published by Reformation Heritage Books in 2014. And he also translated Theodore Beza's treatise on the Lord's Supper, also for Reformation Heritage Books in 2015. His topic for us today is Theodore Beza as exegete, humanist, and polemicist, translating 16th century theological Latin. Please join me in welcoming Professor Noe. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's really gratifying to see so many faces uh, whom I know, and I appreciate your support, both of this project and of the general project of bringing theological treatises and philosophical treatises from these two centuries, the 16th and the 17th, into broader circulation. Um, as you can see, I'll be talking today about Theodore Beza as exegete and so forth, and uh, you'll have to excuse me in that it was very difficult to figure out the the level at which I should aim this presentation. I was hoping for a lot of student attendance, and there's quite a bit of student attendance here, and so I didn't want to assume that uh, anybody would know anything about Theodore Beza. So the first few slides are a little bit of introduction and background on Beza, as well as on his opponent in this controversy, Joachim Westfall. There are others here who are experts in this material and really well versed in this material. And for them, some of it might be uh, a little bit rote. And so I hope, however, there'll be something in this lecture that will appeal to or have some resonance and meaning for all of you who are gathered here. So let's begin then. Beza as exegete, humanist, and polemicist. Uh, this is the way that I tried to squeeze four different emphases into one title, as you can see. Uh, the main one is that we are looking at theology, theological Latin. And a bit of a caveat is in, um, is in, or we are in need of a bit of a caveat there as well, because there is no such thing particularly as theological Latin. Latin is Latin, irrespective of the subject matter with which you are dealing. But of course, in any uh, given discipline of uh, the study of Latin, there's going to be certain vocabularies, certain emphases. So there is such a thing as epistolary Latin, philosophical Latin, theological Latin. But the term means primarily, when I say theological Latin, I mean primarily the subject matter and the special set of vocabulary which Beza is employing. So uh, theological Latin might be the overall or umbrella term. But I think we should be very careful not to assume that simply because Beza's topic or his subject is theology, that he is in some way limited in the kinds of points he makes or the kind of vocabulary that he uses. And this is especially important when we remember Beza's context. He is a child of the Renaissance. He is a child of the Renaissance as it uh, lived and breathed in France in the early 16th century. Uh, as we'll see, he had some phenomenal teachers. He had some phenomenal instructors who taught him Latin. And of course, the men of this century did not learn Latin by studying the works of each other, right? They learned Latin by studying the classics. And uh, it's, it's really impossible to imagine Beza's career, as well as his various uh, choices theologically and in terms of language, without understanding that he was raised on the classics. So that's by way of apology. What's a classicist doing talking about uh, 16th century Latin? Well, hopefully, the point of connection is that, um, like Beza, I was trained on reading the classics. And so there's the connection, I think. So we have these terms, exegete, humanist, and polemicist. So what I want to do today is give you a, a brief introduction to Beza and his opponent, Westfall, give you a brief introduction to the controversy which gave rise uh, to this book, uh, this treatise, and then the, the translation of it, and then look at some specific examples of how it is that Beza used the language in these three registers as exegete, humanist, and polemicist and hopefully then entertain some questions at the end. So these three terms, exegete, he saw himself primarily as an expositor of scripture. 
Now, scholars can disagree about the quality of his exegesis, uh, the influence of his exegesis, uh, but this has been a much studied area of uh, Bayesian studies. Uh, Irina Backus wrote a very important work some time ago on Bayes's influence on the um, composition and translation of the English scriptures, uh, the 1611 edition. Bayes saw himself primarily as an exegete, so he spent around 40 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, writing his Annotationes in Noam Testamentum, that is his commentary, a three-column multilingual commentary on the scriptures, the New Testament in particular, kept refining that and working on that right up until the end of his life. So he saw himself primarily as an exegete. This flowed from his work as a humanist. Uh, any decent scholar of the time needed to be trilinguous, needed to be fluent in uh, Greek, in Latin, and in Hebrew as well. And then, of course, Beza was a gifted uh, scholar in French, a gifted poet, a gifted writer of French, uh, an area in which I'm not really qualified to comment, but it's held generally to be true nonetheless. And in the third place, he was a polemicist. He was a polemicist. That is, he thought that the only proper way, or perhaps the optimal way, to achieve clarity and precision in theological thought was to engage in a kind of um, knockdown, drag out contest with one's opponents. Oftentimes, this involved a great deal of name calling and uh, a great deal of pointed criticism, not just of one's ideas, but of one's person. And I think, in part, uh, the men of this time were imitating their classical uh, forebears. So you have a person like Cicero, who in his speeches uh, thinks that a person's character is completely on the table in terms of their ideas. The, the thought was, if a person has um, bad character, they necessarily have bad ideas. Their character has consequences, and vice versa. If a person has good character, they're going to have good ideas by consequence. So that's part of the basis for um, the justification for polemic. The other part of the justification for polemic is taken from scriptural passages in which Paul uses very strong language when addressing his opponents. He calls them dogs, mutilators of the flesh, and so forth. So this sort of language is generally very distasteful to people of the 21st century, but it was an essential part of public discourse in the 16th and 17th centuries. Okay, so let's advance then. So a little brief biography on Beza, his life and works. He was born in 1519 in the Burgundy region of France. Uh, because he came from an aristocratic or upper middle class family, his father had the resources to send him to school very early. He matriculated first in Paris, and then he was sent to Orléans in 1528, where he studied under the very famous Greek pedagogue, Melchior Womar. Uh, and in that school, when he lived at Womar's home and studied in that school, he was also um, a classmate of John Calvin. That's where they first met. Calvin was 10 years his senior, having been born in 1509. He then traveled to Bourges along with Womar and continued to uh, study Greek and the languages under Womar and also uh, continued to absorb ideas of reform, which were very much in the air in France, especially in that particular city. Um, he returned to Orléans and was licensed to the study of law in 1539. This was the path that his father had set out for him. His father very much wanted him to pursue a life of law, very similar to the biography of Calvin, um, who was destined for a life of law, but whose heart was really in the uh, study of the literatures and languages of antiquity. But for a time, at least, Beza complied with his father's wishes and was licensed in law. He married in 1544, which, among other things, meant that he would not uh, study for the priesthood and would not take religious orders. And in 1548, he published his book of poetry called the Juvenilia, or the Juvenilia. These were um, sort of playful, small pieces in Latin in which he was imitating the classical poets and the more scurrilous and salacious classical poets like Catullus and Ovid and Tibullus. So as a young man went through the order of schooling and perfected his skills as a rhetorician and a polemicist and a, a user of the languages, part of that training meant training in poetry. Poetry brought out a different set of registers for the author than prose would. The use of more colorful and uh, pointed and uh, invective kind of language. 
So Bezos Juvenilia was very successful early on and won him a reputation as a, um, a leading poet of France at the time, both in uh, Latin and then later on when he moved into um, writing French poetry as well. Now interestingly about the Juvenilia, um, in, in these poems in which he was imitating Catullus, there were some items that were considered scurrilous later on, that is detrimental to his character. And later on, some of his uh, Roman opponents circulated these poems very broadly and said, well, actually, Beza didn't leave Paris because he was dedicated to the evangelical cause. He left Paris because he was under a cloud of suspicion of immorality. Uh, charge of sodomy was one of the things that was hurled at him that he was um, run out of Paris, as the story went, by some of his opponents, uh, by the Paris Parliament. He later strenuously denied all of those charges and issued a public apology for this poetry that he had written uh, as part of his youthful indiscretion. So that was in 1548, and he decided then in that same year, October 23, to leave France and to go uh, to Geneva and to introduce himself to his his uh, former friend and classmate, Calvin, who was the leader of the reform movement in that part of Europe at the time. Uh, he began then working uh, in Geneva after coming back from a visit to Melchior Womar, who was now in Tübingen, and he was received at Lausanne by Pierre Viret, uh, who offered him an appointment to the chair in Greek. So then for the next 10 years or so, Beza was in Lausanne, uh, teaching Greek in the academy there with one of Calvin's primary uh, primary lieutenants or associates, Pierre Viret. He left Lausanne in 1588 and went to Geneva because there was a dispute about exactly how much authority the Lausanne consistory had over uh, matters of church discipline, and the Bernese authorities were not um, well disposed towards Beza's views. He thought, therefore, I should leave and go to Geneva, which he did. Uh, coming there in 1558 and took up the chair of Greek at the newly founded academy. At the time of Calvin's death, six years later in 1564, he also took the chair of theology and became uh, the leader really of the Reformation in Geneva at that time and also began to, um, began to cultivate a very broad and international reputation as a reformer. Was invited to represent the Protestant cause at the Colloquy of Poissy in September and October 1561, where along with an Italian reformer named Peter Martyr Vermigli, uh, the two of them sought to defend the Protestant view of the supper against a number of Catholic opponents like Cardinal Lorraine and uh, Diego Lene, uh, all in the audience of the royal um, court there in Paris, including the Queen Mother. And uh, Beza didn't have a lot of success there at that particular colloquy where they were debating over the Lord's Supper because he made a statement that was outlandish uh, at the time, at least, or it, it shocked his Roman opponents, or they at least feigned shock. He said that Christ is no more in the supper than heaven is in the soil, in the earth. That's how separate they are. And Beza met specifically with respect to Christ's physical presence, but this was a very um, inflammatory comment that he made at that particular colloquy. The, uh, the authoritative work on it is by Donald Nugent, who wrote about that uh, particular colloquy. It shocked the attendants, and after that, the, uh, the colloquy broke down and there was no real rapprochement thereafter. Uh, from there until 1605, obviously a great deal happened. <laughs> he lived to a very, uh, a very ripe old age, having been born in 1519. He lived uh, really to see one or even two more generations of reformers, which is one of the most interesting things about Beza's life, and that is its length, uh, and became and continued to be a, a heated polemicist and theologian. He wrote the biography of Calvin's life, you might know, um, something like Calvini uh, Vita Accurate Descripta. He wrote um, a table of predestination, Tabula Predestinationis, Another very influential work of his was the Icones, or the Icons, in which he wrote short biographies of each of the living reform, or each of the reformers whom he had known. And he placed in this work um, images of them, or pictures of them, kind of uh, snapshots, you might say. And this was also very controversial uh, because of his opposition to the use of images in worship. Um, he was criticized quite a bit for that. Moving on then to his opponent in this controversy, Joachim Westfall was almost exactly the same age, 
born at Hamburg, 1510 or 1511, a German, uh, educated there and then moved on to Lundberg. In 1532, he went to the University of Wittenberg, where he studied under both Luther and Melanchthon. And in terms of his own theology, this was very significant because Luther and Melanchthon, uh, after Luther's death, parted ways in some respects about their theology, specifically on predestination and on the supper. Melanchthon was intent on trying to reach some sort of peace with the Swiss Reformation and those who came to be called Calvinists. Luther was not nearly as patient or tolerant for those he called sacramentarians and uh, um, Zwingli in particular. And so Westfall, as he was trained by both Luther and Melanchthon, he was kind of torn between these two viewpoints, you might say. Melanchthon trying to accommodate the, the Swiss view, and Melanchthon a close correspondent with Bullinger, Bullinger and Bootser and Calvin and others, and Luther having a more aloof and distant um, feeling toward the, uh, toward the Swiss Reformation. So those who continued on after Luther's death and said that they were loyal to Luther's ideas in theology came to be called Gnesio Lutherans, from the Greek word Gnesios, which means authentic or genuine. So after Luther's death, those who continued on were Gnesio Lutherans. The others were called Philippists, after Philip Melanchthon. And Melanchthon, again, as I said, tried to bring about peace between the two parties. And the high point of this was in 1549 at the Zurich Consensus, the Consensus to Gurinus, at which um, Melanchthon, in concert with Calvin and others, tried to put forward the sort of simplest um, consensus document, as the name indicates, the least common denominator view of the supper to which all of the Protestant churches in Germany and Switzerland hopefully could agree. Um, they both made concessions on each side, but the consensus that was reached proved to be of uh, little value long term uh, because the underlying issues were still present. Lutherans, Gnesio Lutherans, of whom Westfall is a leading example, Brennus another one, were not going to abandon the Lutheran formulation as they saw it of the supper, which is um, cum, uh, sub, or in, right? Uh, with, under, or in, or in, with, or under. That that's where the body of Christ is and the blood in the elements. And the reformers of the, the Calvinist variety were not going to give up this distinction, uh, which he made clear, which Beza made clear in 1561 at Poissy, between Christ's presence in heaven and his absence physically from the supper because of the ascension primarily. So then, um, after he left study in Whitburg, Wittenberg, he came back in 1534 and received a post as a philologist or a lecturer in languages in 1537. He was then appointed as a preacher at the Church of St. Catherine in his hometown of Hamburg where he was to spend the next 33 years and where he died in 1574. Uh, in the 1550s, he issued a number of works that were important to this controversy, and their titles are here. Farago Confusaneorum et Interse Dissidentium Opinionum De Coine Domini. That's the important part, De Coine Domini, on the Lord's Supper. A farago is a, a miscellany or a hodgepodge. It's a pejorative word, um, something that has been sort of cobbled together. So if you go home, you open up a cupboard door and all the pots and pans not my home, but all the pots and pans are sort of scattered around in no particular order, or your sock drawer, you have black socks and white socks and brown socks all mingled together. That's a farrago. So it's a pejorative term to describe a sense of um, disorder, carelessness. So a farrago of confused opinions, confusanearum opinionem, and ones that are inter se dissidentium, mutually contradictory, not agreeable one among another, on the Lord's Supper, congesta, drawn from the books, the works, sacramentariorum, of the sacramentarians. So if one is a Lutheran, then Zwingli and Calvin, uh, and they drew no distinction between them most of the time, Zwingli and Calvin and Beza are sacramentarians. If you deny the physical presence, then you are, um, according to Gnesio Lutherans, you are simply saying the supper is nothing. There's, there's no power of grace in it at all if you deny the bodily presence. Then in 1553, he issued another work, Recta Fides De Coine Domini, The Correct Faith, The Proper Faith, and this contained an exposition of 1 Corinthians 11 and an explanation of Christ's words of institution. This is my body, right? The Latin word est, 
the Greek word esti, this is my body. What does Christ mean by that? All of the sacramental dispute, as many of you know, uh, hinge on that. Is it a figure of speech or is there something else involved? And finally, in 1555, I say finally, uh, leading up to our dispute, but Westfall was by no means done. He was very, very prolific. He wrote a Collectania Sententiarum de Aurelii Augustini de Coina Domini and, well, I don't know what that's doing there, but <laughs> Fides Kirilli Episcopi, uh, you, know, you know you're, you're doing all right when you're shocked by an English word, right? <laughs> you have a sense of shock by an English word, that's a good, that's a good reaction to have. And the faith of the uh, Bishop of Alexandria, Cyril, on the presence of the body and blood of Christ. So, not only uh, did they argue exegetically from Scripture, but they argued about the opinions of the fathers, right? Because as, as Calvin famously said in his preface to the Institutes, he said, Augustine is completely ours, right? Augustinus totus noster est. He's completely ours. So a lot of this controversy, not only between Calvinists or Reformed and Romanists, but between Calvinists and Lutherans, was over the fathers. Whose side are they on? Augustine and Cyril and Chrysostom and so forth. Well, for a while, Calvin was engaged in dispute with Westfall. But this is his, as you can see up there, his ultima admonitio, Ioannis Calvini. My last warning. This is my final word, Calvin says. The last word of John Calvin to Joachimum Westphalum, cui uh, nisi obtemperate, and if he doesn't listen to this, he says, I'm going to treat him just like Paul says, uh, you should treat heretics. Eo loco postaca bendus eret co pertinaces, pertinaces hereticos, stubborn heretics. This is my last word of warning. After this, I'm out of the debate. And as you can see, that was 1557. So Calvin had debated in three separate treatises against Westfall's opinion, as Westfall was trying to drive a wedge, you might say, between the Concord that had been reached between Philip Melanchthon, or into the Concord that had been reached between Melanchthon and some of the Swiss reformers. As a Gnasio Lutheran, this was Westfall's mission to show um, the Philippists are not really um, children of Luther and they have misunderstood the scriptures. That was Westfall's point. So this was his last word. And uh, there's a plug for Bruce Gordon's biography on Calvin of 2009. If you'd like to read that, he deals with all of these episodes in the 1550s exhaustively and in a very interesting fashion. So that was Westfall's last word. I'm sorry, that was Calvin's last word, but it was not, it was not Westfall's last word. So in 1558, he published this, an Apologia Confessionis, a defense of my confession on the Lord's Supper, de coina domini contra corruptelas et columnias, against the foolish ideas and the slanders of John Calvin, written by Joachim Westfall, um, at the church in Hamburg. And there he quotes Jeremiah 23, in which he says, uh, specifically, the Lord of hosts says these things, don't heed the words of prophets who prophesy to you and deceive you. So this is a kind of a direct assault against Calvin. All of you who are treating Calvin as a prophet, which Calvin sometimes did himself, as in his 1537 letter, in which he cites Ezekiel and says, with a lot of boldness, um, after you read my work, you will know that a prophet has been among you. Uh, Calvin says very boldly, I think he developed a little more restraint later on, but I know opinions will vary on that. Um, Westfall says, don't listen to them. Visionum cordis sui locuntur. They speak the vision of their own heart, right? Or the, the content of their own heart. They do not speak de ora domini, according to the mouth or the voice of the Lord. So Westfall drops this out into public argument, and Calvin says, I'm done with this guy. Didn't you read my ultima admonitio of the year before? I have no more time for this. Um, although scholars generally say, and this is the argument that uh, Martin Klauber makes quite well in the introduction to this book, that Calvin's views were influenced quite a bit by Westfall in terms of refining his own ideas on the supper when it came to subsequent editions of the Institutes, especially the 1564 edition. But even though Calvin was done with him, the controversy wasn't over. So then he said, Beza, will you please write against this guy because we can't let this argument just drop altogether. We have to have uh, the last word in this. We have to clarify and continue on in the fight. 
So he employed Beza in this task, and then Beza took up the cudgels, you might say, uh, against Westfall. So humanist, exegete, and polemicist, and here we need two definitions because the entire treatise is about these two points. Um, what is a synecdoche and what is metonymy, right? What are these two figures of speech? They're very similar in some ways. A figure of speech in which a more inclusive term is used for a less inclusive one or vice versa. So it could be completely the opposite. As a whole for a part or a part for a whole. Formerly sometimes used loosely or explained differently. Metonymy the action of substituting for a word or phrase denoting an object, action, institution, etc., a word or phrase denoting a property or something associated with it, as an instance of this. So the whole debate centers on this. What exactly is Christ doing in the words of institution? And how are we supposed to understand other passages of Scripture, like 1 Corinthians 11, uh, where Christ is referred to, or in chapter 10, where Christ is referred to as the rock, and he's referred to as the lamb, and there are all of these other figures of speech, apparently, uh, in the scriptures. Beza and the, the Calvinists maintained these are figures of speech. Um, Westfall and the Gnesio Lutherans wanted to have a more, um, you might say, literalist interpretation. So the three works that were translated for this volume are these three. First of all, Beza's De Coina Domini of 1559, uh, Plana et Perspicua Tractatio, a clear or plain and simple treatise in which, there's that word again, calumniae, the same word that Westfall used against Calvin, in which the published slanders, edithi calumniae, of Westfall are at last, finally, completely done away with, refaluntur. But of course, Westfall wasn't finished. He had to have a response to this because that's how it goes. That was in 1559. Then in 1570, um, Beza wrote a Summa Doctrinae de Re Sacramentaria, which I think is about seven pages. It's very, very short. It's almost like a catechism of the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper. And uh, we, ha we have actually the translator here this afternoon. My student, Chris Santacola, uh, did the first draft of that, and then I helped him um, try to polish it up into a presentable form. He did a, a really fine job, so you should congratulate him after the, after the talk if you have the chance. And it was thought because this was um, sufficiently small and it was a nice complement to the treatise, it would be uh, attached to it. And then in the third place, the third one is the 1577 treatise, at Lakes Dei Moralis Ceremonialis et Politica, Ex Libris Mosis Excerpta. So the law of God in its moral, ceremonial, and political registers, you might say, or moral, ceremonial, and civic registers taken out of the books of Moses, Ex Libris Mosis, and distributed into various groups. And there was another student, a young uh, woman named Leah Gelder, who is in Oxford this fall, who did the first draft um, of this. And so we added that into the, um, into the work as well. So if you're really interested in finding out uh, into which of these three classes do you, uh, did Beza think various Mosaic laws belong, like the law against uh, mixing fabrics, right? Part of the Mosaic law. Where did Beza think that belonged? Into which of the three classes which Calvin had developed? You can go to that and you can look and you can see um, what Beza thought. So it's a, it's a resource, um, I think, that's valuable in that respect. Maybe I should pause for a second and entertain questions before we move on, also so I can get a drink. <coughs> Okay, if not then, let's take a look at the beginning here. Praefatio in tractatum sequentum adversus Joachimi Westphale Columnias. Um, and here we see part of his polemic register. When you had first begun, Joachim, to attack so irritably those who had deserved no such thing for their treatment of the Church of God, nor for their treatment of you privately, even if it was painful to read the inscription of your little book, nevertheless we read it carefully. It was painful to read because it was not difficult to understand at whom your attempts were aimed, no doubt so that you might shake the foundations of peace and harmony. So, of course, Beza presents himself and Calvin as the uh, champions of Protestant unity and Westfall as the divider of this unity that they hoped for with the Lutherans. And I put this up here because this is all one sentence. 
right? The Latin style is such that you can have a number of subordinated clauses without interrupting the flow of thought whatsoever. In fact, expanding and strengthening the flow of thought. It had to be broken into uh, three sentences in English in order to make it more manageable. Um, he says, certainly we read it in such a spirit that if you were offering any new argument with which you could uncover any error of ours, we would rather migrate to your position than stubbornly defend our own. Now it's up to you, if you want to read the work, to find out whether you think Beza is being sincere in this and genuine, or if it's just rhetorical posturing to the detriment of his opponents. Uh, I honestly have a mixed opinion after having worked on it. Sometimes I think he's sincere, other times it seems like it's more the polemic of the time and rhetorical posturing. Moving on uh, quite a bit later in the text, um, another interesting thing about going through Beza's works is that even though Beza is not necessarily the, the, the most famous uh, reformer, we are here at Calvin College at the, the, the uh, Meter Center for Calvin Studies, sprinkled throughout Beza's works are a lot of really important historiographical items about the men uh, and women with whom he had such uh, close contact. So here he mentions both Calvin and Bullinger. He says, when this hope had so disappointed us that we saw you were not rendered more temperate by the rather passionate address of Calvin or by the very kind response of Bullinger. So if to historians Bullinger, uh, the Zurich reformer, seems more approachable and moderate and Calvin seems more distant and thundering, that's how it seemed to Beza as well, at least in uh, this work, right? The more passionate address of of Calvin or the more um, mild one of Bullinger. Instead, you were even spreading these flames broadly. What else could we do than what Paul or orders others? That is, keep away from you entirely obdurate man. And going down here then to the last portion. For just as you imagine, we hoped that by our warning you would then fall silent. If only you yourself had not long since acted in such a way that we gave up hoping for your silence. So that's supposed to be a joke, right? Westfall won't ever shut up, according to Beza. We've given up hope, right? Desieremus, ut sperara desieremus, that you would ever stop this argument. So this is part of the polemic register, you might say. <clears throat> More mentions of Calvin here. They desire that they be allowed to use their own forms of expression. This is a reference to the... Uh, the Gnesio Lutherans, Westfall, and these other opponents. He says that Calvin is readily allowed to extricate himself with the help of a figure of speech, provided that it corresponds to Christ's words and intention. And just a little bit later, when he says that his own supporters, whom he calls generals, have attacked nothing except made-up figures of speech, to what end did he ridicule us as tropists, symbologists, and figurists? So this is really important in the um, course of the debate. A general standard charge from the Gnesio Lutherans like Westfall is that the Reformed were addicted to figures of speech, symbology, and tropes. They could not give those up. And if they would just give to the scriptures a plain and simple reading, like the Lutherans did, this is my body, um, then they would understand that Christ is physically present um, in, with, or under the elements of the sacrament. And so then the, the entire work hinges on this as Beza sees it, demonstrating that if one reads the scriptures without employing figures of speech and symbols and tropes, you're going to come up with um, a pile of inconsistencies. There's no real way to square the many different things that the scriptures contain. But I said also that, Calvin or that uh, Beza was a humanist. And so I find it really interesting that not only does he cite uh, Chrysostom and Augustine and Cyril and Tertullian and Origen and Cyprian and many, many other uh, fathers, all of whom you can find in the index to the book, of course. But he also cites pagan authors. And as soon as he does, Westfall criticizes him for it, and Beza has an answer. He says, Homer, for example, in his Iliad Book 3, when he describes the proper covenant of consecration, writes, etc., the pista here, said Eustasius, are tasphagia. Consequently, we hear that the victims themselves are called the covenants. So what is Beza doing? He's going to a pagan source, namely Homer, the shared sort of 
uh, context from which all these men drew, or the, the shared resource from which all these men drew. And he's demonstrating that Westfall should understand figures of speech are common in religious contexts. In fact, even a pagan like Homer knows that. The implication being, Westfall, how come you can't uh, figure that out? So in this ritual context, pista here are the oaths or the covenants. They are used interchangeably with the word for victim, tasfagia. And this is not for some unknown reason, but obviously so that after the curses are administered, the blood of one who had violated the oath would be spilled in such a way. So on the very next page, and I didn't have time for that, uh, Beza cites Virgil from the Aeneid in exactly the same way. So you see uh, pagan poets understand this. Even in religious contexts, figures of speech are common. The Genesio Lutherans, like Westfall, should understand this. Westfall shouts that we set the spirit in opposition to the word and rehearses a lot of arguments on this score about the spirit and the letter. Skipping down then, but what kind of fair judge would believe Westfall in this, even if he took an oath? On this point, he plainly shows his cunning in the way he makes his argument. Christ, he says, did not lack flesh just because Peter ate him spiritually. Thus, the notion of chewing Christ's body, and that's uh, the word here, mandicatio, which is one of the central terms in all of this dispute, mandication, the physical chewing, or mandukandum, uh, just because uh, the notion of chewing Christ's body should not be dismissed just because it must be chewed spiritually. And Beza there says, obvious point of agreement. So Westfall, we're with you on that point. Obviously we agree with that. For a spiritual mandication does not, or mandication does not discount the truth of his body. So to chew on Christ spiritually in the supper does not in any way say that Christ does not have a physical body. But according to Beza and Calvin and, and Martyr and others, it does mean that Christ is not physically in the sacrament. He is um, ascended, right? If you chew on him physically in the sacrament, then you are guilty of cannibalism. And to try to make this point much later in his life, according to Beza, guilty of cannibalism, much later in his life, uh, Beza wrote a dialogue called the Creophagia, a Greek title which means cannibalism in which he compares Lutherans and others to the Cyclops of Odyssey uh, Book 9, I believe it is, saying that, well, if you really want to chew on Christ, then this is, this is how you are. This is what um, Beza thought and what he taught. And now a little bit of the polemics and the humor. Now you have to understand that Beza and Westfall were from different social classes and they were from different cultures. Beza was uh, a mildly well-off aristocrat, French aristocrat, and Westfall was a German. So they had different tastes and different interests and different backgrounds. So he says, if Peter had, in keeping with Westfall's opinion, eaten the body of Christ, the Jews for sure would have had no more to crucify than Westfall would have to drink if he were the last to snatch up his tankard after all the beer was drained away. This is just a gratuitous slap at all those beer-drinking Germans, right? That's what they do up in Germany. They mostly drink beer, not like good Frenchmen like Beza who drink wine. Forgive me, kind reader, for the utter foolishness of this rude man compels me to speak like this about a serious topic. You can see, Ignosca quaeso, elector, namutita in reseria loquar, cogunt importuni hominis inepti ai. This foolish man, inepti ai. And of course, there's a figure of speech even in that, when the author of the work pauses and turns and addresses the reader directly by apostrophe, right, a studied figure of speech, and um, Bayes' education would have been such that a large part of his time would have been spent memorizing figures of speech and employing them in Latin and Greek compositions. Here you can see uh, some of his exegetical skill and some of his use of logic, which was the, the standard charge of Westfall against Beza and Calvin, uh, that they were devoted to tropes and figures and that they preferred reason over uh, revelation. They preferred reason over revelation. We know for sure that the ascension did not swallow up the nature of Christ's body. And this is an important theological point, but only its weakness. So when Christ ascended, he did not... Uh, lose his physical nature, he only lost 
the, uh, the properties of it that were constitutive of weakness. Now to the Lutherans, they would say, one aspect of weakness is being physically limited, right? And um, they call that uh, circumscription, a perigrapton, as we will see in another slide. Beza and Calvin and others said, no, that's a natural property of a physical body, to be limited to a certain time and space, to be circumscribed, a perigrapton. And therefore, Christ is physically in heaven, uh, in fact, the session of Christ where he sat down at the right hand of the Father, it's mentioned in Hebrews uh, 4 and many other places, um, means that he can't be physically present in the um, sacraments. We confess in the middle paragraph here that all Christ, all of Christ is in all places at the same time. So there's a debate about what totus Christus means. What does it mean that that Christ is at all places and in all times, provided this notion is understood with respect to his person. As I would say, yet we do not grant that all which belongs to Christ, like his physical body, his human nature, is in all places at the same time. That's the distinction. For wherever the Son of God is, he surely exists as one with his human nature conjoined. This is the point that uh, Beza was maintaining against Westfall. So just a few more slides here. And we will finish up. We confess that the whole of Christ to us, um, the whole of Christ is offered to us, particularly in the Lord's Supper. And we grasp Him by faith and the Spirit. We do not with Westfall demand a true conjunction of the members with their head, such that the body of Christ in actual fact penetrates our bodies or our souls. So there is no uh, physical feeding on Christ in the, um, the Reformed view. And I've underlined this part, this is emphasis added, uh, because it shows, I think, very clearly the nature of the conflict between them and the disagreement. It was over what's the proper use of human reason. And the, um, the Lutherans, the Genesio Lutherans, faulted Beza and Calvin for relying too much on reason. And the other party said, well, we rely only as is proper, and you simply don't understand human reason. So at one point, Beza says to Westfall, you should go back to Peter Lombard, back up 300 years, 200 years, and study dialectic again, because clearly you don't understand uh, the nature of philosophy. I am sure Westfall will bawl in his usual way that these conclusions were trundled out of the storehouse of philosophy and human reason and will hurl at us his little faith slogans. Now, if you do end up reading the book and you read it carefully, I think you'll notice that at the beginning I was translating in a, in a fairly restrained way, uh, not wanting to make any errors, but as I got nearer the end, I became more confident, and so this is quite a bit more idiomatic, but still accurate, I think, quite accurate. It's quite a bit more idiomatic than some of the early um, parts of the book. And also, one has to change register depending on the context. So, if Beza is giving a careful exegetical argument, you want to be very careful not to allow any sort of um, imagination, in terms of your translation, to distort the argument. There's not as much danger of distortion here because it's a more uh, narrative portion. It's, a, it's an invective as well. As if the question, whenever the things that are indicated to us by God's word surpass human comprehension, were whether we should trust in the word alone rather than all the arguments of all the persons in the world. So Beza throws a flag of irrelevance on Westfall, right? This is irrelevant. The point you're making isn't, isn't relevant. It's not a question of the word versus reason. It's a question of proper understanding of reason. And he says uh, Westfall fails in that regard. Similarly, if Westfall could produce one syllable in which the Lord teaches that this is so, we will believe even if common sense should raise a thousand objections. So Bayes is trying to demonstrate that the, the bar is not reason, the bar is scripture, but reason has to be understood and used properly. And this is where, according to him, the Lutherans uh, fall down. If whatever common sense dictates must be rejected, and if there is nothing in which the teaching of scripture is consistent with common sense, and if being a theologian and being stupid mean the same thing, let Westfall even deny that God is one and that he governs the world. So he switches right back to polemic, right, in these three different registers. Let him deny that Christ was truly a man because Thomas is compelled to confess this after touching him. We, however, will on this understanding gladly grant that Westfall is not only a theologian,
but even the very best one. So part of the reason for polemic, I think, is the entertaining value for the reader, right? That was part of it. Uh, unless we want to assume that at all times these men felt uh, only deep hatred for one another. No doubt they did at some points. So moving to the end now. <clears throat> Because Westfall really added this chapter superfluously, what is the point in arguing with him? But of course, Beza will, because you can't leave any point unanswered. And then notice the men that he cites. He introduces Basil, Cyril, Chrysostom, Ambrose, Augustine, Gregory, Nazianzus. In fact, whom does he not cite? No doubt so that he may appear to be a man of great and diverse reading. And yet his disagreement with us has nothing to do with this. And he spends the next several pages seeking to demonstrate, specifically with respect to Augustine, and Chrysostom that the Lutherans are reading them incorrectly. And in this, Beza is imitating Calvin, among others, because one of Calvin's first writings uh, was the preface he wrote to the French translation of the Bible by his cousin, Pierre Oliviton. Um, and in that, he gave a list of those Greek and Latin fathers that he thought should be especially studied. And of course, uh, Augustine and Chrysostom are at the top of that list in the two languages, respectively. <clears throat> and then the all-important word, aperigrapton, without circumscription. Let him see which of the two are refuted by these authorities, whether those who construct the truth of Christ's body from the scriptures and regulate their interpretation of scripture by this measurement, or rather the one who invents an invisible body and one without circumscription. Aperigrapton, uh, with these uh, ligatures of the 16th century. So, not circumscribed, grapho meaning to write, perigrapho, a perigrapton with no circumscription. So the reform view is that um, a human body, which Christ really has, has to have physical circumscription. And the Lutheran view is physical circumscription is one of those things that a glorified body does not have. So if you read the scriptures carefully, you know that there are instances after Christ's resurrection where things seem to happen to his physical body that were not like normal human bodies. And of course, Beza goes through every one of those instances and exegetes them carefully. And uh, Christ walking on water, um, Christ apparently moving through a wall when the doors were closed in the upper room, and so on and so forth. So he shows his exegesis there very carefully. And he holds that a body without cir circumscription, it est corpus non corpus. That is, corpus non corpus. If it's not circumscribed, it's not a physical body. And that's, that's really the heart of the uh, reformed view as Beza presents it. Okay, we've already spoken about the adoration of Christ and the bread. I wanted to include uh, this little part here because it's right near the conclusion of Beza's work and at the end of the work he adopts a much more pastoral, you might even say charitable, uh, generous tone. A lot of the uh, polemic begins to recede into the background and he makes a plea. You can decide whether he's sincere or not, uh, whether you think he is sincere. He makes a plea for a kind of reconciliation with the Lutherans at the end of the work. And he lays out what their practice is. He says, we have never desired even to deal with such matters publicly, that is, uh, some particulars about worship. So he says, we Reformed have tried to re uh, refrain from being too particular about, about worship in some ways. We do not doubt that they are unsettling to all noble and well-educated men. And daily among ourselves, we realize how many problems must simply be tolerated in this wearisome office. We have petitioned the Lord constantly, and we continue to ask Him to grant the ministers obedient people and to grant the people prudent ministers. And we ask Him most of all to rule and strengthen us each day by His Holy Spirit so that we can see what is useful to the churches. And in this part, Beza also describes, which I find quite interesting historically, what is the sacramental practice of the Reformed churches. So according to the Lutherans, they were admitting to the supper a lot of people who should not have been allowed. And Beza says, we do not require a confession of our congregants each time they take the Lord's Supper. The first time they take the supper, we take them aside and ask them if they understand what it means to discern Christ's body, which, Calvin, which uh, Beza defines as having sound doctrine of what the supper is. And then they are admitted to the table. And once they are admitted to the table, uh, then their lives are watched over, but they are not required to confess each time they approach the supper. And this was a point of contention uh, between the two sides, because the Lutherans wanted um, Beza and Calvin to require this in the Reformed congregation. Well, I think that if, if one wants to think the thoughts of others after them, 
you have to expose yourself to the same kinds of sources as much as you're able. Uh, now, they had certain advantages in their education that we don't have, but they had an enormous number of disadvantages that we don't have. Uh, so the disadvantages that we have are that we study a large number of things, and we generally don't learn any of them at great depth until much later in life. They studied a much smaller number of subjects, specifically the languages uh, and mathematics sometimes, and they started very early, and they did nothing else. So they started studying languages at ages five and six, and Junius and Calvin and Beza, and for 10 years they did nothing but study the languages, and they learned world history and so forth via uh, Latin and to a lesser extent Greek. So because they had that very obsessive focus, they learned those subjects <coughs> very deeply. The number of disadvantages that they uh, had are much more than ours. So if you wanted to consult a particular author, even after the printing press you know, became uh, widely used, you sometimes had to travel a long way. For example, when Peter Martyr uh, left Italy, um, left um, Lucca, he left there most of his library with a note saying, please send all my books when you have the chance. Well, and that happened a couple years later. Uh, it didn't happen right away. And um, you couldn't easily consult things. So we have so much more uh, opportunity than they had to have direct interaction with these works. So if, if that's what you're thinking to try to do, I would encourage you, yes, go back to Cicero. Uh, Calvin read Cicero every year. And a lot of his work is not even comprehensible, I would say, without some understanding of Cicero. Dr. Noe is actually the teacher of it, so perhaps I can... And I paid him to say that, too, so. <laughs> Perhaps you can say something about that resource, because I think it's wonderful. Actually, we uh, are doing uh, Cicero right now, but we have looked at some uh, name from the Reformation, and Richard Sibbs recently, and Calvin, and, and so on. So perhaps you can just say how much it costs to subscribe. Oh, it's free. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> you, knew, you knew that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you can just say how to subscribe and... Uh, well, you just go to the website and subscribe, and then each day you get a small snippet of Latin that I explain. So if you liked the last 45 minutes of monotone, you can get that every day. <laughs> so. In more digestible chunks. In more digestible chunks. And you can pause it, right? <laughs> so. Other questions? Yes, Mark. Uh, David, do we know anything about his sources for, like, Homer, like, which editions he used? It's standard uh, editions that were coming out of Paris. Uh, I want to say um, Boudet. Um, I'd have to be more, I'd have to double check. But um, there, w there was a tremendous amount of uh, f French pride that animated both Calvin and Beza in their careers and um, seeking to outdo men like Erasmus and um, you know, men who were from other nationalities. So I can't say that. Uh, I don't know the particular edition. Someone knows, but I don't have that at my fingertips. Oh, sorry, behind. Go ahead. Um, so I've seen some theological debates on Facebook. Oh. And there's a, you know, the, the rapid speed affects the tone. How did the slower pace of publication, hmm. this timeline of these debates stretched out longer, how did that affect the tone or the logic, or uh, how did the presentation of the debate affect the debate itself? Right. So uh, the premise of your question then is that it did, right? And in a w I think, and in a way that's different than the rapid dissemination uh, today, I would say that probably what you find, and we saw an example of this in, in the repetition of a word like calumniae and corruptella, um, what you find is there's more resort to familiar and standard language. Um, so maybe the fact that these controversies were waged over a decade meant that eventually you run out of kinds of invective that are considered um, acceptable. And so you begin repeating the same sorts of invective. Now, I don't know if that happens on Facebook. Um, does it? Um, yeah. How do you? Once you run out of stuff to say. Yeah. Uh, also, I think the the slower pace, even even though there's no proof that these books were that these treatises were edited by anyone except the author, they came back from the printer and they were reviewed by the author before they then were committed to the press. Um, there was the opportunity for a great deal of 
careful scrutiny if they wanted because it came, uh, these works came out over the course of a decade. So hopefully that would suggest the argumentation was stronger and more careful than what you might find on Facebook. Yeah, go ahead. Um, curiosity, was this in, in any way maybe a, a group effort? Um, I know that, um, that uh, the pastors in Geneva tended to collaborate with one another. I'm wondering if, if uh, you think that something like that was happening here. So it's not, um, Beza might have the, the title, you know, the name on the, on the front page, right. but um, this is sort of a, a community effort on the part of the Reform in Geneva, is this a Beza's? I don't think so. I think it's all his work. And maybe he asked, I, I doubt he would have asked Calvin since Calvin was sick of it by 1558, but he may have asked the opinions of others. Uh, they, he was in constant correspondence with Bollinger and Bootser and others, um, and not, not Bootser this late, I don't think, but I forget his date of death. But um, no, I think this is all Bayes' work. I don't think it's a collaborative effort. There's no indication that it is. And Bayes' Latin, which is a very high quality, uh, you can read it in other places. It, it corresponds to this very closely. He's a superb stylist, fantastic Latin. So, uh, I know uh, you. Yes, you know me. Vim Janssen at uh, Leiden talks about how Calvin's view on the Eucharist changes over time. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, he emphasizes much more of a true spiritual kind of presence when he's trying to, to mend fences with the Lutherans and find common ground. And then when he kind of gives up on that, he moves much closer to Zurich in the more symbolic. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the end of his life, maybe in fifteen sixties, he kind of moves back. Did you see? What did you see in terms of? Did you see uh, Beza trying to come to any kind of definition of a spiritual presence? Oh yes, okay. yes. I mean, I didn't dwell on that. I took that as a given. But yes, he says that. Um, he, he's even willing to use the term substantialiter. Right? We substantially feed on Christ. Non corporaliter, uh, nec corporaliter, nec um, carnaliter. So we are substantially feeding on Christ. 